Welcome to our lecture on the six kingdoms of life. This is actually not a new topic, right, Miss Hines? No, this is something that we've talked about before. You made a pamphlet about it, but today we're going to review. Yeah, um, and all of this information obviously is going to be on the SOL. So today we're going to be talking about classification, how we classify things. And all living things can be classified into taxons, which just is a fancy word for group. So if you see this word on the SOL, you just want to think to yourself, a taxon is a group. And there are seven taxons that all life are placed into. Um, so what does this tell us about living things? Well, the reason why we're going to use taxons or groupings for organisms to have a better understanding of how closely related they are. Okay. So it's kind of like if you had a CD collection mm -hmm. and you had a little bit of rap, a little bit of country, a little bit of gospel, uh -huh. you wouldn't want to necessarily keep them all dumped together because then it would be hard to find what you're looking for. So we're going to be using these groupings or taxons to make it easy to classify or place things um, so we have a better understanding of their how they're related. Okay, so let's take a look at those taxons or groups. So here are all of the taxons or groups that we can place organisms into. The first taxon or group is something called the kingdom. And the kingdom is the, the biggest group that an organism can be placed into, and that's what we're going to focus on today. It's the, the most general group, and there are six kingdoms of life, and we've, we're going to go into some detail about them. So if this is the biggest, what does that mean about how many individuals are actually in that there, taxon? There's going to be a lot of individuals in each kingdom, lots. And, and as we move down this list, there's going to be fewer and fewer individuals in each of these taxons or groups. So the order is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then the smallest taxon, the most specific one, is the species. So we need a way to remember this. All right, so let's come up with a mnemonic device. Okay. All right. The easiest mnemonic device that we've come up with is simple. Mm -hmm. It's kings play chess Kings on fat green snakes. <laughs> Play chess on fat green snakes. I'm picturing that in my mind right now, and I don't think I'm going to forget that. And so notice again that the first letter of each of these words is the same first letter of each of our taxons or groups. So if you can remember this sentence, you should be able to put these taxon or groups into order. And it's important to know the order because, again, if we're comparing the kingdom taxon to the species taxon, we know that there's a difference in the amount of organisms found in it. Right. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you write the mnemonic device down on your paper. So here's an example of how we could classify an organism into these different taxons. So this is a picture of a killer whale. Mm -hmm. um, and so the killer whale is in the kingdom Animalia. Now, again, that's a really big group. There are a whole lot of organisms in that kingdom. Every animal on that planet is in that kingdom. Um, but then we can get more specific. The killer whale is in the phylum chordata. The class mammalia, that should look familiar. This is going to contain just the mammals on earth. The order Cetacea, the family Delphinidae, the genus Orsinus, and the species Orca. So if we were looking, let's say at the species level, Miss mm -hmm. Hines, what are the only organisms that would be found at the species taxon? At the species level are going to be only other killer whales. Okay, um, but if we were to look at the kingdom level, there's going to be all animals, all different animals of on so Earth. things like insects, right? Humans, right? Um, so monkeys, yeah. So we can see that it's getting smaller as we go down, right? All right. So take a sec right now and answer your stop and jot question, and make sure that you ask your teacher to look over your answer before you go on. Okay, so today we're really going to focus on, again, the most general taxon, the kingdom. And there are six kingdoms of life. Here they are, and we're going to go through each one. We're going to talk about some specific characteristics as well as some examples of organisms in that kingdom. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, and just remember that you're going to be filling in your notes. There are two things that we're looking mm -hmm. for, unique characteristics, and then we're also looking for um, examples. Okay. So starting off, here are our RK bacteria. And so what are some of the unique characteristics of this kingdom? Well, the first thing that I notice is that the word bacteria is actually in the name of the kingdom. So let's think about just some things that we know about bacteria bacteria in general. So bacteria never have a nucleus, right? Right. They are prokaryotic. So that's my first unique characteristic that I'm going to write down on my paper. Okay. And we also know that bacteria are really small and they're only uh -huh. made up of one cell. Right. And we call that in science unicellular.
unicellular, meaning they only have one cell. And then a unique thing about this particular kingdom is mm -hmm. that these bacteria are never really bacteria that we come in contact with. So they don't cause sickness no. in humans. Um, and the reason why they don't is that we cannot live in the extreme environments that these extremophiles can live in. Right, yeah. If you look in that word extremophile, you see in a, a description of where they live in extreme places. So what does that mean? Like really hot temperatures? Yeah, really hot, really cold, really salty, really acidic, really basic, um, things with poisonous gases, things that we could, could never deal with. All right, so let's look at some examples of where we might find it and what it might look like. Okay, um, so this picture up here is of a hot spring, so obviously very, very high temperatures. And so um, some extremophiles might live here, um, some bacteria that really, really like it, very, very hot. Right. And then in this next picture, this is a picture of the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. And so what do we know about the Dead Sea, Miss Hines? We know that it has a lot of salt. It has a very, very high salt concentration. So a lot of the things that we see around us, living things, could never survive in this right, environment. Right, which is why it's come to be known as the Dead Sea, because there's not much alive there. And then if we look down at the bottom, there's a picture of a bunch of little tiny circles. Mm -hmm. Each one of those circles is actually a singular organism. Right, because it's unicellular. It's made of just this one cell. Yeah. So for the archaeobacteria, we're not really looking for you to know the names of them because mm -hmm. they have some crazy names. Mm -hmm. And the SOL is not going to ask you about specifics. But we want you to be able to tell us that you know if you had to go somewhere to search for them, you'd know where to look. Right, go to a place in an extreme environment. All right, so let's move on to the next kingdom of life, which is? The U bacteria. So again, again <laughs> look there, at this name. There's bacteria in the title. So we know that there's going to be some things in common with our archaeobacteria that we just talked about. So all bacteria, it doesn't matter what kingdom of life we put them in, all bacteria lack a nucleus. So what are we going to call them? They're prokaryotic, pro right. new. And then all bacteria are very, very small, and they're only made up of one, one. cell. So they're unicellular. Okay. And then another thing to know about this kingdom is that these guys are the oldest living things on the planet, which is pretty crazy if you think yeah. about it. Yeah, planet Earth is 4.6 billion years old, so yeah. that's pretty old. And then our last thing is a really important term that you'll probably see on your SOL, the word mm -hmm pathogenic or pathogen, which means what, Miss Heinz? Um, a pathogen is something that can make you sick. It's a living organism that can cause diseases. Yeah, so things, uh, if you have a bacterial infection, um, it's not going to be archaeobacteria because we don't come in contact with those, yeah. but you bacteria is all around us. Right. You guys are covered in it right now, mm -hmm. and you're touching it on your table. Yep. All right, so let's look at some um, examples. Okay. Um, so this is a picture of a bacteria called Streptococcus. Well, that sounds familiar. Streptococcus. Yeah, it does, um, especially the first part of this. Um, many of you maybe have had strep throat in your life. This is the bacteria that causes that. So again, it's a pathogen. It can make you sick. And again, if we look at this picture, each of these little circles is a separate organism. It's an individual bacteria. So it's unicellular. Let's pop on over to this other one. So these are circular over here on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, they almost look like rods. Yeah. Um, this is a picture of E. coli bacteria, a bacteria that lives in your digestive tract and helps you digest your food. Yeah. So it's important to keep in mind that while the eubacteria are pathogens, there are also a lot of eubacteria that help us out that are really good for us. In fact, most of them are, are bacteria that are good. So they, we have a symbiotic relationship with them? We do. We are mutualistic. We give them a home to live, and they get food from us. Awesome. So... Um, we haven't talked about symbioses in a long time, but that's definitely something that's going to be on the SOL. Right. All right, let's move on to our next kingdom, the kingdom protista, or the protists. protists. So protists are unique in that they share a lot of things in common on the surface with bacteria uh -huh. in that they are unicellular. So unicellular. they're very small, just one cell. But there's a distinct difference between protists and bacteria. And that mm -hmm. distinct difference is that protists have a control center found mm -hmm. inside the cell that we call a nucleus. So what kinds of cells are these? These are eukaryotic cells. Remember, you do have a nucleus. Right. And you are a, a eukaryote. eukaryote. And then the last thing, which is just something to note, is that protists, because they're so diverse, mm -hmm. they're kind of like the garbage can kingdom. Whatever <laughs> didn't fit anywhere else, we just kind of threw it into this kingdom. Mm -hmm. They can be both heterotrophic 
or autotrophic. So let's right. talk about what those two terms mean. Right. So remember, heterotrophic means that you have to eat or consume in order to get your energy. And then autotrophic sounds like the word automatic, which uh -huh. means that they automatically make their own food. Right. So they can make it themselves, kind of like plants. All right. So let's talk about some examples because protists are pretty cool. They're pretty weird. And they're also pretty, some of them. Yes. Um, so we can start down here. This is a, a close-up picture of green algae. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people think that algae are plants, but they're actually not. They're actually protists. Yeah. And um, this is stuff that you guys come in contact with all the time. You probably don't see it this way. You've probably mm -hmm. seen it in a pool that hasn't been cleaned mm -hmm. or that still green, water that's turned green. green. Stuff. But all of those things are just unicellular organisms mm -hmm. that have a nucleus, so they cannot be bacteria, that happen to be photosynthetic, so they're autotrophic. Um, up here we have a picture of an amoeba, which is another example of a protist. And amoebas, again, are unicellular. Mm -hmm. These guys are weird. They have these uh, weird projections mm -hmm. called pseudopodia or pseudopods, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later. But they use those not only to move, but also to feed. So if mm -hmm. they have to feed, they're not autotrophic, they are heterotrophic. they got to eat stuff. All right. Let's bump over to the other side. Um, so this is a picture of diatoms, which are organisms that live a lot in the ocean. Um, and again, they, they make their own food, very similar to algae and to plants. Right. Um, and then this last picture down at the bottom right-hand corner is paramecium. And paramecium are unique in that they have all these little, little tiny hairs. hairs on the outside called cilia, which we've talked about before mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about again in the future. Um, that's their unique characteristic. Uh, so you just need to know that all of these guys, even though they look very different, mm -hmm. they're all members of the same kingdom because they're unicellular and they have a nucleus. Okay. All right, fungi is our next kingdom. Fungi, when we when I think about fungi, I think about mushrooms, just yeah. to, because it's the easiest place for your mind to go. But right. let's talk about um, what fungi have in common, regardless of what type of fungi they are. So these guys, again, have to have a nucleus, because the only thing that doesn't is bacteria. So these guys are all eukaryotic. Mm -hmm. What makes them different, though, from our protists is that we're starting to look at organisms now that are big. Right, they are multicellular, they have many cells. So these are things that you can walk around and you can see without a microscope. Right. And then another thing that lots of people don't know, they think that fungus are like plants, but really they're not. Fungus cannot no. make their own food. No, they got to eat stuff. But the way that they eat makes them truly unique. And this is always the question that you'll see on the right. SOL. We're going to ask you what organism or what kingdom of life eats by absorbing their food. So right. they digest externally, mm -hmm. sit on top of their food source, yeah, and, and then, then they, they just absorb, absorb it. it in. So fungus always absorb their food. They don't have a stomach on the inside, so they mm -hmm. have to take care of all that process before the food actually enters their cells. So let's look at some common examples. Um, so here's a mushroom, which is, of course, what first comes to mind. Right. So that's made up of many cells. All of those cells have a nucleus. Mm -hmm. If we look over there on the right-hand side, that's a slime mold, which is mm -hmm. also another type of fungus. Mm -hmm. And then on the very bottom, we have these things that are called shelf fungus, which we've seen. You guys have probably seen if you've ever yeah. been in the woods. Um, shelf fungus are pretty common, just as prolific as those mushrooms that you see in the upper left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. What do all of these things have in common? Multicellular. They all have a nucleus. And they feed by absorption. That's the key. All right, let's go on to the kingdom plantae or plants. And we've talked a lot about plants this year, so we already know a whole bunch about plants. So first thing we know is that they have a nucleus, so they are eukaryotic. eukaryotic. Um, we can see them without a microscope. They must have many cells. They are multicellular. And then one of the defining characteristics of plants is that mm -hmm. they can make their own food doing a unique process called photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Right. So even though we listed those as two separate things, they're pretty much one and the same. Right. These two are related to each other. And then the last thing, when you look at plant cells, they have a very different shape compared to animal cells. Right. So plant cells are very square, whereas animal cells tend to look more kind of circular, not, not having a very rigid shape. But plant cells are very rigid and square. And that's because they have a structure on the outside of their cells that is absent in animal cells. All plant cells have a cell wall on the outside. That's really important. So those are our five, our, our five defining features. Let's see if we can apply them to some examples. So here's a picture of some flowers or tulips. Right. So all of these guys 
are going to be classified, even though they look very different, they're all going to be classified in the same grouping. These tulips make flowers, so they're commonly referred to as a specific type of plant known as angiosperms, um, which just means they make flowers mm -hmm. to reproduce, which, and we've seen that in class. Mm -hmm. They're all photosynthetic, they're all multicellular, they all do, um, they're all autotrophic, and they all have cell walls. Um, this is a picture of moss. Moss belongs to a class of plants called the bryophytes. Um, and these are plants that tend to grow low to the ground. They don't grow very big, but still we can see them without a microscope. They're multicellular, they have cell walls, they can do photosynthesis, and so they're in the same group as some of our larger plants. Right, and over here on the right-hand side, we have a picture of a really tall cedar. Cedars are commonly referred to, we tend to group them in general. Um, we know them as gymnosperms or as evergreens. Mm -hmm. They don't ever drop their leaves. So those are three examples of plants that all share something in common. That's why we group them in the same kingdom. All right, let's move on to our last kingdom of life, which I think is our most interesting kingdom. Right. Our little um, bias. It's yeah. we're a part of this kingdom. So kingdom animalia, or the kingdom that contains animals. Let's talk about some unique characteristics. And the great thing about this kingdom is if you forget, you can just think about yourself. yourself. This is us. This is people. So... Are you a prokaryote or a eukaryote? You are a eukaryote. So we know that all animals have a nucleus inside their cells. Are you unicellular or multicellular? Well, we can see animals, so we know that they have to be made up of more than one cell. Otherwise, right. it would be impossible to see. Do you make your own food or do you need to eat stuff? We need to eat stuff. In yeah. fact, right now I'm pretty hungry. Okay. So I can't make my own food. I wish that I could. Right. And then the last thing is that we're modile. What does that mean? Um, that means that we can move around. So we don't need to stay in one place. We can, we can get up and move and go get our food. Yeah, and that's a really important adaptation that gives us some advantages over some of the other kingdoms of life, like right. plants or fungus. Yeah. All right, so let's look at some examples. We have some pretty far-reaching examples, <laughs> just to make sure everybody knows what's going on here. In the upper left-hand corner, we have pictures of sea sponges. Mm. Now, most people wouldn't think that sea sponges are in the kingdom animalia, but remember, if it meets all of those classifications that we talked about mm -hmm. previously, those characteristics, with the exception of movement, because not all organisms in the kingdom right. animalia move, um, then it has to be in this kingdom. It can't go anywhere else. Right, but it's eukaryotic, it's multicellular, and it eats stuff. It's heterotrophic. Right. And then we have this picture of a tuna over here on the right-hand side. So fish are in the same kingdom of life um, because they meet, again, they're, they're able to move, mm -hmm. they are multicellular, they contain a nucleus, and they have to eat food right. from an outside source. Ooh, here Down we here, we have some hissing roaches, some mm -hmm. hissing cockroaches. These guys are insects, but again, they meet all of the characteristics of life that we talked about that allows them to be in yeah. this particular kingdom. A lot of kingdom. people don't think of insects as animals, but they are. They're in the same kingdom of life as us. And then this last picture, most of you know who this is. This is Wiz Khalifa, right? Right. So he's a human. He's just like us. He shares those same characteristics. Believe it or not, he has a lot in common with sea sponges, a lot in common <laughs> with tuna, and a lot in common with hissing seeing cockroaches right. just like we do. All right, so here's what we need you to do now. It's time for a stop and jot. This is an important one. You need to prove to us that you can compare and contrast all of the kingdoms of life. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure that you come and see us once you're done with your stop and jot.